Greetings to all of you in the name of Jesus and welcome to Bible in a Year. This is day 196. A couple of more days, we're going to find ourselves in a whole new hundred section. Praise God. I thank God for the progress that we are making. I am rejoicing over the discipline that I've seen in myself. And you know what, man? To be 100 and to keep it a stack with you, I really thank God for the grace. Yes, I have to exert some kind of effort, but I thank God for grace because what grace is, grace is the divine influence of God's love upon the heart. And I need that constant and continual voice speaking to me. Don't forget about Bible in a year. Hey, you got to do Bible in a year. Hey, this is something that you want to do. Let's be diligent. Let's work on that. Let's get it knocked out. And I thank God for that. I need that. In the world that we live in today, we have the most distractions that I think, in my opinion, the world has ever seen. I mean, they're, the phone on its own and by itself can serve as a tool of distraction. You have notifications going off from your email. You got notifications going off of your messenger. You got notifications going off from your Twitter account, from your Instagram account. You got YouTube notifications going off. You got Facebook notifications going off. And then there's TikTok and Periscope and all of these other social media items not to mention the things that we might be using for work or other things. And you got your text messages that are going off. The dentist is sending you a kind reminder that you need to be there to have a root canal done and they'll be glad to take your money. There's so many things that would distract us from the purpose. And the enemy is a master strategist. The Bible says that we ought to be aware of the wiles of the devil. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices and uh, that we should be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So it is my opinion that in a warfare scenery, why wouldn't the enemy use things like that to distract us? Why would he not purposely employ his followers to distract God's people? Not everybody that proclaims the name of Jesus is working or submitted to Jesus. And it's a sad reality, but the warfare, we are deep in the game. And the warfare, it can take its toll on us. So I thank God for grace. Grace is that measure that I look for that is beyond my own ability and beyond my own capabilities. Grace comes from the resources of God's presence, His throne, His power, His ability to keep me. And it takes the pressure off of myself to perform and to be righteous, which is something that none of us can do. Because the Bible says that there is none righteous. Not one of us is righteous conditionally. But I thank God by His grace and through faith, we are righteous positionally. So it is by the grace of God, and it is the grace of God that I want to credit for the ability to remain as consistent as I've been, because this is something that it, it's not a strength that I have. Organization is not a strength that I have. And management, especially self-management, is not a strength that I have. I need lots and lots of grace. And people think that I'm joking. They always say, yeah, hey man, what do you want me to pray for? Grace. <laughs> I need grace. Pray for grace. If ever you wonder, I want to pray for Brother Klaus, what should I pray for? Pray for grace and wisdom 
I need grace and wisdom continually. I need so many prayers that I'm under the impression that I cannot pray for myself at all. I need more prayers than I can pray for for myself. So thank you for those of you that are standing in the gap for me and that are mentioning my name to the throne. This is Bible in a Year. And if this is your first time joining us, I want to welcome you and encourage you to make a commitment to the Word of God. This right here, the Bible, the Word of God, is the foundation of discipleship. And that is the business that I'm in. Now, somebody might say, well, this is God's thing and it's not a business and it's the church and we need to do the work of the kingdom. And yes, I understand your zeal and your passion. And I know how to correctly place that in the setting of today. Jesus told Peter that he was going to make him a fisher of men, a fisher man is a businessman, a fisherman or fishermen, they operate a business. They are in the business of fishing. It is a business because there is a price and there is a profit. There is a work and an effort that needs to be exerted in order for the business to be prosperous. And in the same way, this is a business. That's exactly why Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. Now, I understand that when some people hear the word business, the first thing they think about is, oh, they're trying to profit off of the church. And that is the incorrect ideology to hold concerning what we're talking about here. Being in the business of people or in the business of God's kingdom and his affairs is not at all about trying to generate a monetary profit like some fools would propose. And I call them fools because it's ignorant. And I've been there myself. But I thank God for the things that in his mercy he's allowed me to see where I was boasting and propagating foolishness out of my mouth, God sat me down and said, baby boy, let me show you something. What you're saying and what you're doing, it's not right. It's, you're, you're off by a, a whole lot. And I see that you have a desire for truth. Let me teach you. And I don't know how I wasn't rebellious or stubborn. Perhaps it was the love and gentleness that God has which inspires me to be that way. And oftentimes I find myself so far from the grace that God has. But anyways, it's the love and gentleness of God dealing with me that allowed me to come to a place to where I could receive and learn. And we need that, especially today. We need the grace and the love of God. So the word of God is a foundation for discipleship. And I said all of that to make this point that we are disciple makers. Jesus wants us to be disciple makers. There is a price to pay for you to be a disciple maker. And there is also a profit to gain for heaven and for you to make disciples because we are winning souls, hearts to God, the most precious treasure to God on earth is the soul and the heart of men and women. So let us bless God. We're going to do it for grace and glory. Feel free to join us right here with day 196. Or if you want to, you can go back to day one and you can just flow through the days like we did. All of those videos are available to you on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet and you think that this is a worthy ministry that will help you and uh, position you in the kingdom. By all means, subscribe, stay connected. We would love to be connected to you and uh, see all of the wonderful things that God has in store for all of us come into fruition. Praise God. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 17, verse 6. And today I do not have a lot of scriptures. We are in a new book, the book of Amos, and I just don't know a whole lot about Amos. I was doing some research to try to prepare myself, but you know what, man? I'm just not turned on by microwaved meals. I don't want to give you a microwave. Oh, my feet, my God, I want to run somewhere and shout. <laughs> I don't want to give you a microwave sermon. I don't want to just read something real quick so that I have something to give you. I want it to flow raw, authentically, 
holistically and organically, spiritually speaking. And so whatever happens, happens. Let God draw out of me what he has placed in me. Proverbs chapter 17, verse number six. I am reading from the King James version of the Bible, but you can feel free to follow along with whatever version you have or whatever version it is that you are comfortable with. And this is what the word of God says. Children's children, that's grandchildren, grandkids to some of us, grandbabies to others, babies, kids, to yet some other folks. <laughs> Glory to God. Grand, uh, children's children are the crown of old men. And the glory of children are their fathers. When I read this verse, it touched me. I don't know why it touched me. I don't know that I understand the depths or all of the implications that this word would imply, but I recognize that something in this verse reached out to me, something connected to me. And I suppose in my mentioning this, my aim also is to explore what might be found in it with the hope of finding something valuable, which I believe there is a nugget in there somewhere to be discovered. And the glory of children are their fathers. That's what stood out to me. And perhaps it connected to the place in my heart that was fatherless. I grew up with my father not being in my life. My father was absent. I have probably two working memories of my father and I've shared that before in a previous video. So I relate to the fatherless. I understand the pain of not having a father and the Bible specifically mentions father. I want to see in the Old Testament if the Hebrew word is specified to be father or if that was just a translational thing. Father, children's children, father, ba -da -da -ba -da -ba. fathers, ab. Oh yeah, I did. I looked it up. It means father. I forgot that I looked this up. Praise God. I was more prepared than I realized. That word does mean father because the reason why I'm mentioning that is I read another version and the other version, it just changed the meaning. And I don't understand how can you just decide, okay, well, it says this, I'll just, I, I think I like this word here. It says parents. I believe it was the NIV, if I'm not mistaken. Let's, let's have a look. Let's poke around for a little bit. I perceive that we may have, you know, some time. Let's poke around. Let's go to Bibles here. And yes, the, or the NLT. Grandchildren are the crowning glory of the aged. Parents are the pride of their children. Okay, in the uh, online version, it does say that the Hebrew specifies fathers. That word parents, however, can be misleading to cause one to think that both mother and father and nothing against mamas. We love you. Praise God for you. You're the reason why we're here. You carried us for nine months. Thank you for all of that you did for putting up with daddy. Well, I don't know what he did that you put up with, but I thank God that you did. Praise God. But the Bible specifies fathers, and there's an emphasis to that for a reason. And the Bible says, the glory of children are their fathers. I have heard it said, and I've heard it taught and preached, uh, both from secular sources and from biblical sources, that the father is the one that has the power to validate the children, that there is a validation that a father does when he interacts with his kids. And the validation says, I acknowledge you. I love you. I see you. You are valuable to me. You are worth my love and you are worth loving. And there are messages both that mothers and fathers communicate, but there is an emphasis on father here. This is probably why the Bible or God has revealed himself as father. It, it's not God, the mother, like you have some twisted, deluded 
blind, full of error churches today propagating a gospel of God the mother and they are liars. And if you know somebody like that, they probably need a lot of prayer. Help them, Jesus. But the glory of children are their fathers. It appears to me that in today's world with so many absent fathers, and it is my opinion and belief that the system has been manipulated to strategically root out fathers in the homes. And... Uh, that appears to be one of the agendas of the LGBTQ community, the Planned Parenthood. It, it just seems like in many cases that I've observed and experienced that the father doesn't really get a say in someone getting an abortion. Like it's like his word means nothing. So I, I see from a personal standpoint that there seems to be an organized effort to root out the fathers and... There is a reason. One of the sad things is of today's society that we don't really see that as a whole and we don't understand the importance of a father. Some of us do, and I thank God for that. It is now our responsibility to become a mouthpiece and to roar that, so to speak, in the name of Jesus. But it looks like the devil wants to rob children of their glory and that is their fathers. So to all of the dads watching, God bless you. May the Lord continue to give you wisdom in this father-defying age that we are living in. To all of the moms watching, thank you for supporting dad. Even if dad is difficult sometimes, praise God. Thank you for your prayers and your dedication. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 17. It's the same chapter. I said that like we were going to go to another book. Verse 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. The Bible shows us, you know what, man? When someone jacks you up, don't dwell on that. We, we shouldn't dwell on that because when we dwell on that, it's going to become bigger and it's going to become a wedge that breaks relationships. And what's the first thing that we do as people? <laughs> well, I know about myself, but we dwell on that. I've dwelled on things like that. I sit and fume and ruminate in my mind. It's just over and over. Imagine the frying pan that you put oil in it and the oil is hot. And then you put something in the oil and it just sizzles. That's what rumigating means in my mind. Fuming, letting it stew, some people would say. And that's not good to do. But the scripture shows us something that seeking love, seeking love is done by covering a transgression. Forget about it. Let it go. Cover it. With what? With love. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life. What is life? Life is in the blood. Jesus shed his blood and in so doing he laid down his life. And he covered us with his life. He covered us with his blood. All of our sins, if we've been baptized in Jesus' name, that doesn't apply to people that have not been baptized in the name of Jesus. A wonderful incentive for you to be baptized in Jesus' name if you are looking for a church to baptize you in the name of Jesus and not the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, then you've come to the right place. Kindly send me an email with your name, state, zip code, and the contact number where you can be reached and email it to digitaldiscipleministries at gmail.com and we can connect you. So, love covers transgressions. Seeking love is covering a transgression. And the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son to what? To die. He died how? By pouring out his blood. His blood covers us. There's a connection there. And when we want to be like God, when we seek to love, we cover transgressions. That's, that's really seeking love. If you seek God, then start covering people's transgressions. Protect them. 
Let's go to Romans chapter 2, verse 29. And I just wanted to point this out because I've heard a lot of arguments and debates concerning end time matters and eschatology that, oh, well, this only this only belongs to the Jews or this prophecy is only for the Jews. So this verse jumped out at me and I just thought, you know what? This is an interesting idea to present. Let me just speak it and release it and watch what happens to it. Romans chapter two, verse 29. The Bible says, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of God, but of men. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Aren't we inward Jews? Aren't we engrafted into the vine like Israel? It's just something to consider. I don't want to go anywhere with that. I just want to make mention of it. And I don't know, perhaps tuck it away somewhere in your, this is interesting file. Let's go to Amos chapter one, verses one and two. We are now in a new book. Amos is considered to be a minor prophet in the Old Testament. I do not know a whole lot about Amos. I've always been interested in really studying in depth the prophets. I've probably read this a couple of times and thought, you know what, this is boring. I don't know what's going on. I'll just move on to something exciting. But here we are. The book of Amos and verse one and two say in the KJV, the words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. We read about Uzziah or Uzziah or Uzziah. I think it's Uzziah. In the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, Two years before the earthquake, there was an earthquake. The earth shook. God has been in the earth shaking business. And verse two says, and he said, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn and the top of Carmel shall wither. I want to point out that the Bible says that Amos was among the herdmen. This could mean that it has a couple of implications. Actually, it could mean that perhaps Amos was a shepherd or maybe he was in business selling cattle. There are scholars that believe that he was a rich man that and he forsa- he, he sold his business or forsook the riches to go and follow God. And then there is another understanding that says, oh, no, he was just a poor guy who was a shepherd and He, uh, because he was a shepherd, he was able to speak to God's people and represent uh, the people. And just like David was a shepherd. So there are different ideas floating around concerning Amos. However, we do see that Amos had some words that he saw. Wonder if this was a vision. Um, I read earlier today that there was a comparison made to the Apostle John, who testified in 1 John that they handled the word of life. Not only did they hear the word, but they saw the word and they handled the word of life. There could be some similarity here. Furthermore, Amos said that the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Now, Amos was a prophet, a spokesman. So perhaps this was a reference to himself that God had given him words that really represented God roaring over the nations. And it's interesting that he would use this uh, imagery of a lion and roaring and shepherds and herdsmen. Do, Do you remember that didn't David kill a lion? that came for one of his sheep. Wasn't it a lion that David killed? And that would just paint a picture that shepherds as a people, as an occupation, would be quite familiar with the roar of a lion. A lion was an enemy of the sheep. 
lion would come and grab a sheep and be about his business if the shepherd didn't intervene or if there wasn't time to step in. So the fact that he's painting this picture of um, th these shepherds and then he says that the lion, the Lord will roar, that's, that's imagery. God is sending out a warning right before he strikes. And oftentimes God does that. God will send a warning before he sends judgment. We just got done reading about Nineveh and how God sent Jonah to roar to Nineveh and they repented. So God will send a roar, a warning, signaling for the people to repent. Now, I, I saw on Facebook something very interesting. Um, an associate from the network CTN uh, posted a post about ROAR and she used it as an acronym. And the words ROAR stood for reaching out across regions. I was like, wow. Let our voice, let the voice of truth reach out across regions, across domains. Let the whole world hear God roar through his people, the truth. We should be sounding the alarm like Amos is doing here. And uh, in hopes that some would hear and believe and we know from scripture that not everybody will believe. There will be some that will remain in their unbelief and our job is still fulfilled in roaring at them. So don't be discouraged if people reject what you have to say that you know God sent you to speak. There will be those. But rejoice over the ones that do receive the word and because of the message that God gave you, they repent. And they turn towards God and endeavor to live a life for God, forsaking the old sinful lifestyle. And that's something to celebrate and to look forward to. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may he be gracious to you. And may he give you peace. God bless you in Jesus' name.